And uh, But before we get into the reading of God's Word this morning, let's pray. Let's pray for the Lord to do what He said, or what we prayed in that song just a minute ago, that the Lord would speak to our hearts to conform us to the image of Christ by His Word today. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come before you this morning as a people in desperate need of a word from God. We pray that you would take this word that you have given to us, your holy word that we hold open before us, and by the power of, your, of the working of your Holy Spirit, would you conform us to be more like Jesus today. Oh Lord, we, we face so many struggles, temptations, discouragements, fears, uncertainties. But we thank you that down through eternity that you have given us this dependable, trustworthy, always true word. I pray that we would stand upon it today. And remind us, Lord, to be thankful for this word that you have given to us. I pray for our young people today, as, uh, as they are in junior church, that you would work in their hearts. I pray for gospel-proclaiming ministries uh, all around this community, all around the world, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would go forth in Holy Spirit power today. We commit this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if there's anything that characterizes the world today, and many things that we could say characterize it, but one thing that is overwhelmingly apparent, it is uncertainty. Uncertainty, right? It, it doesn't seem like it would, well, in many ways it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but in other ways it seems like it was centuries ago that we were able to, with relative certainty, plan things for a week out or plan things for a month out, right? Or even sometimes to go out on a limb and plan something for a year out. These days, who of us has any idea what we're going to be doing in a month? Uh, we have learned by painful experience not to set ourselves up for that kind of disappointment. Um, we, if nothing else, we've learned to maybe have a little more flexibility concerning our planning, a little more flexibility concerning our schedules. And, uh, you know, there are some families that uh, the calendar was uh, very rigidly choreographed. And these days we have learned that that is absolute foolishness because things can change very, very very quickly. May I ask for a, just a show of hands. How many of us in this room have had to cancel or reschedule some type of a vacation in the in the past year and a half? Raise your hand. All right, most of us. Most of us. Um, I've often been reminded in these circumstances of James 4, 13 to 16, as uh, I've been tempted to be bothered by uncertainty. It says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend time there and buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or do that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. All such boasting is evil. We've never really had the control over our lives that we often fancy ourselves to have. But in these days, it seems that we are drowning in a sea of uncertainty. And we have questions like, 
Will I be able to find what I need when I go to the store? Will I show up at the airport and find out that my flight has been canceled because there was nobody to staff the plane? When I need help with something, will there be anybody to help me? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to be able uh, to afford my utilities this winter? All of these questions have come flooding in on us these days. Now understand, I'm not one of these old codgers who's always hearkening back to the good old days. I, I try to be very careful careful about that. But let's be honest. All of us, let's be honest. Products are not what they once were, are they? Products are not what they once were. How many of you have a working appliance in your house that was purchased prior to 1990? Raise your hand. A working appliance in your house that was purchased prior to 1990. Some of you weren't born prior to 1990. Yeah. All right. So a few of you, all right? So uh, when, when, when Julie and I got married in 1995, we bought a used dryer from somebody for 25 bucks. And he had bought that dryer used from somebody else. I didn't ask for how much. Still working today, by the way. So, I mean, I've changed the belt on it a couple of times, but it's still going. Uh, the newer models come and go, but one thing I'm pretty confident of, I'll be dead and gone, and that dryer will still be checking in for work. Um... Remember when they first started coming out with the uh, the newfangled uh, flat screen TVs, right? Um, we all figured, well, you know, once my old TV wears out, I'll go out and when I need to buy a new one, I'll get one of those uh, new nice uh, flat screen TVs. Meanwhile, you've got that old TV that you remember firing up to watch the 85 Bears beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl, right? And they, you're thinking, okay, this thing is eventually going to die. And if you wouldn't have, ev have eventually just said, okay, forget it, I'm throwing it out and I'm getting one of the new ones, you know as well as I do, that thing would still be turning on today, right? You have, uh, you have replaced your newer TVs three or four times in the meantime. That one would have still been going. Uh, things are not made to last today. A few years ago, I took the bait and overspent on a refrigerator that had all kinds of bells and whistles, right? And uh, even went on, if I'm going to pay that kind of money for a new refrigerator, I even went in on the extended warranty. And now on that warranty, they, uh, they replaced the ice maker a couple of times, but when the warranty finally expired, so did the refrigerator. Meanwhile, your grandmother's avocado-colored refrigerator from 1967 still lives on, right? It is still going. Now, in order to save 20 bucks a year in electricity, we junk that old one and spend $2,000 every couple of years for a new model. Uh, I mean, back in those days when your grandmother bought that uh, avocado refrigerator in 1967, I don't even think they sold an extended... When you went to the store, when you went to buy at Sears and Roebuck that, uh, that refrigerator, they didn't offer an extended warranty because why would you need it? They would have laughed at uh, the salesperson in that day. Uh, uncertainty grates us, doesn't it? Uncertainty grates us and the insurance and warranty industry has been built on this reality and the old saying is there's nothing certain but what <laughs> death and taxes nothing certain but death and taxes now just as an aside that's a great way to start somebody down a gospel conversation what are you certain about really what are you absolutely certain of and uh, one thing that we can be certain of even bigger than taxes is death the fall has hurtled this world into a chasm of uncertainty 
in my lifetime, this uncertainty has been increasingly more apparent. And I'd say, you know, post, uh, post two, uh, September 11th, 2011, I mean, that uncertainty has always been there. But when that, when that day happened, it just kind of hit us in the face, didn't it? All of a sudden, we realized just how uh, thin of a thread we hang upon. Against this black backdrop of uncertainty, the Bible is full of certainty. The Bible is, actually, is absolutely full of statements of certainty and absolutes. In fact, you would be hard-pressed to come to any reading of your Bible for the day and not find some statement of absolute certainty there. And people are starved for certainty these days. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The testimony of the Lord is sure. Romans 4.16 says that the promise of God's salvation is sure. 2 Timothy 2.19 says that the foundation of God stands sure. 2 Peter 1.19 refers to God's word being a more sure word of prophecy. In today's culture, certainty and absolutes aren't only absent. Certainty and absolutes have, they have sought to banish them from polite society. It's, an, it's offensive for someone to speak up in a world of doubt and claim to hold absolute truth. You know, it's like walking into a store. You need to find a bolt. You are doing some repair on your home. You need to find a bolt to replace something. And there are, when you go to, this is not an easy thing, right? You've got to figure out how to replace this bolt. There are certain measurements that distinguish that bolt. Am I right? Certain measurements that distinguish it. There is the length. There is the size. There is the type type of head that is on that bolt. There is even whether the threads on that bolt are standard or whether they are coarse. There are certain measurements. Those measurements might be metric, they might be imperial, but they're absolute measurements. You can go in and say to the person that is trying their best to help you find this replacement, you know, I have my own measurements, that I, I have my own system that I've worked out, and I need you to find a bolt according to my measurements. It doesn't work that way. I mean, you might say that, but if you do, I don't recommend ever trying to shop for hardware, for parts, for countertops, for appliances. I mean, the list could go on and on. If that is your way, you are going to have a very hard time in life. But yet, we think that it's acceptable these days for someone to claim to have their own version of truth. That is a normal thing these days. What do people say? Well, you've got your truth and I've got my truth. No, no, no. There is truth and it stands outside of all of us. It is bigger than all of us. I mean, understand that an inch is a very small measurement, but an inch is bigger than you. It is bigger than me. There are certain things that are truth, that are standards, that we must submit ourselves to. And for the Christian to walk into a room where there is nothing but banter and wrangling, one person presenting their truth, another person holding their own version of the truth, for the Christian to speak up and claim to possess absolute truth that must be submitted to universally. This is what God says about how things are to go in the home. Here is what God says about what is right, about what is wrong. What happened in the past, what, hap what will happen in the future, this is what God says and we are called to submit ourselves to that. This is not only shocking today, it's outrageous. It's offensive. 
The Christian, you have submitted yourself to the truth of God. You submitted yourself to the truth of God. And the truth of God is a single body of truth. I can't say, well, I like this about it and I like that about it. But this other thing I won't take. No, it is a single body of truth that we must submit ourselves to, take it or leave it. And this submission to God's truth leads to certainty. Submission leads to certainty. If I'm going to find the right bolts to replace that bolt that was broken or missing as I'm working on my project, I have to submit myself to the system of measurement that distinguishes that part, correct? If I'm going to live life and please God in my life, if I'm going to be a Christian, I need to submit myself to the truth that God has given to me. Submission leads to certainty. If I don't submit myself to the system of measurement, I may go get a bolt at the store, but the chances of that bolt fitting in, what do you think the chances are? Pretty much zero. But when I submit myself and I say, here's the dimensions, here is, the, here is what the, defines the threads, I can, I can be absolutely certain when I get that and I pay for it at the store and I take it home, that I'm going to put it in the hole and it's going to thread in right because I've submitted myself to this, uh, to these, to this truth. The Christian has submitted himself or herself to what God has said about our sin about the price that has been paid for our salvation. We have embraced what God says as truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 says that in Christ, all the promises of God are yes. That's powerful. In Christ, because of Christ, all the promises of God are yes. Embracing Jesus Christ and his salvation brings us from the no of God and the banishment of God from his fellowship and blessing in heaven to the yes of, uh, of salvation, of peace with God, of heaven to come. Embracing Jesus Christ and his salvation brings us from death to life. Without Jesus, we can only know condemnation. Knowing Jesus means that there is therefore now, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So John has written this epistle of 1 John about being sure, right? John has written this epistle about confidence. Chapter 1 and verse 4 says this book is written that your joy might be full. Joy can only be full when there is confidence. There is no way that you are living the experience of full joy if you are not sure that you have peace with God. If you are not absolutely sure that your sins are forgiven, that you are not abs if you are not absolutely sure that you're on your way to heaven one day, you don't have the fullness of joy. That's why the word know and its derivatives, to know things, the confidence of knowing, that word is used 39 times in the five chapters of the book of 1 John. Of those 35 times, seven of those are in the passage that we, that we will read today in this last section. You see, faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is a step into the glorious light of God. The Christian, we are not just wishful thinkers. We are not just hopeful, uh, hopeless optimists. We know the believer can be absolutely sure of his or her standing with God. I know that I'm on my way to heaven. 
I know that my sins are forgiven. Therefore, I don't have to face death with any uncertainty. I don't fear death. That's been said many times. I don't fear death. I'm not crazy about dying. Okay? I mean, there is a natural apprehension about what that process is going to look like. Is it going to be sudden, unexpected, traumatic? Is it going to be elongated and painful? We don't know that. 1 Corinthians 15 refers to the body being sown in dishonor. And that's talking about just the difficult days of, that, that, that very often precede a person's passing into the presence of God. And those days, it's hard to watch someone go through that ordeal of seemingly having all of their dignity stripped away for them, from them as they traverse their final days. The body is sown in dishonor. I can't even fathom facing those days without that certainty of my sins being taken care of. Can't even fathom going through that dishonor, those challenging days, without a knowledge, without an understanding that I have a home in heaven when I close my eyes in death. That when I get to the other side of that valley of the shadow of death, I will find the welcome home of a Savior. I can't imagine facing those days without that certainty. This passage gives us a list of things in which we can have confidence. Confidence. First John chapter 5. We're going to begin our reading in verse 12. It's a lengthy introduction. Verse 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life uh, for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. That is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. So we're going to see in this final section of the book of 1 John some things that we, have, that we can have confidence in. Some things that we can be confident about. This morning we are going to cover one of those things. But it's a big one. Number one, we can know that we have eternal life. We can know that we have eternal life. What a blessing! What a grace from God that we can know that we have eternal life. I talk to people and I ask them, do you know? And they say, I hope so. I think so. I'm pretty sure. I say, how can you not know? How in the world can you put your head on the pillow at night without that confidence of knowing what happens next? We can know that we have eternal life. Verse 12 says, to have the Son is to have life. It's not a complicated thing. To have the Son is to have life. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I know that my sins have been paid for, have been crucified with Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for me. He took the penalty of my sins upon himself. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm not in death. I'm living in the life which is in uh, the faith of the Son of God. Look back a few pages in your Bible to chapter 3. So in the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, in verse 1, uh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. We know. We know. It's not an uncertain thing. It's not a hope-so thing. It is not a, you know, I think my chances are better than nothing. We know that we have life. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. As if hiding something away to protect it. You are protected from condemnation. You are protected from God's wrath. You are protected from the ravages of the devil because your life is hid with Christ in God. If you are a believer, you are forever united inseparably to Jesus Christ. And for you to be banished from heaven, Jesus Christ himself would have to be banished from heaven. So certain is your union with him. Our life is hid with Christ in God. Your status in Christ is confirmed because it's his work. It is not that you are trying your best to earn it. It is not that you have your good days and your bad days and you're hoping that God will uh, look upon your goodness and not think about your badness. No, we are in Christ. If God looks down on me and, ha and sees the best that I have to offer, I have no hope because even my best is not sufficient. He looks on you if you are a believer and he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees his own beloved son in whom he is well pleased and that is how we have confidence. Since we were raised with Christ, there are certain things that will be true of us. But these things are not true of us in order to merit being in Christ. Since we are in Christ, there are certain things that we are going to put off, certain things that we are going to be moving toward, but we are status before God is forgiven. No condemnation, forever united to Christ, and every believer revels in that reality. We worship in that reality. That is something we can come back to over and over and over and over again. What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything? What comes to your mind most often? What comes to your mind most often is what you love and what you worship. If you are wrapped up in your own political ideologies, if you are wrapped up in your fears, if you are wrapped up in your job, if you are wrapped up in your finances, if these are the things that you rest upon at all times during the day, if you can't get enough of these things, these are the things that you are worshiping. You have lapsed from appreciating to worshiping. We need to seek those things. We need to rest in these things which are above. Seek those things which are in Christ. In this world, 
we may make a reservation. You know, I, I went on vacation a couple of weeks ago, and in order to go on vacation, I had to make flight reservations. And you make those reservations, especially these days, and you say, boy, I hope my flight doesn't get canceled. I hope the flight crew doesn't go on strike. This has been going on. I hope it doesn't happen. Especially, I was thinking, oh, I've got to come back the day of a funeral. Lord, I've got to get back, Lord, up everything to go well. You get over there, and you've made a reservation for a rental car. You've made a reservation for a hotel. And you know, in this world, you can make all the reservations you want, but that reservation is only as strong as the entity in which you are reserving it, right? How often does somebody come to the desk and say, oh yeah, I've got, a, I've got a reservation in this hotel tonight. And they say, oh, I'm sorry, we've given away your room. Well, what good is the reservation if you can't keep the reservation? In this world, the reservation is only as strong as the entity that it is reserved in. And our status is reserved in the bank of heaven and the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is ironclad, that is eternally secure. And we have this confidence of eternal life. Having life in Christ is going to result in continuing to believe in the name of the Son of God. How do you know that you are saved? First of all, look back at verse 13. How do I know that I am saved? These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. You cannot get to the right destination by driving on the wrong road. Okay? That seems like an obvious statement. If you are going to have confidence, if you are going to know that you are saved, if you're going to know that you have peace with God, the first step is to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. To believe everything that the Bible presents about who Jesus Christ is, about what he has done. We believe on the name, and that is the totality of the revelation of God about Jesus Christ. We believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you believe? Do you believe? Most people say, well, I believe this, but I'm not so sure about that. What are you doing? You are putting yourself above the truth. You think that you have the right to pick and choose what things you will believe and which things you will not. We must believe everything that this book has proclaimed about Jesus Christ. We must believe it all. This truth stands above us. This truth stands outside of us. We must submit ourselves to it. We believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you believe? But you know, belief in itself, that is not even enough. The Bible tells us in the book of Jude that the demons believe and they tremble. They tremble. People say, oh yeah, I believe in God. They don't tremble before him, tr tremble in his presence like a demon. We believe in the name of the Son of God. But what this is talking about, it's not just believing that Jesus Christ is. It is submitting ourselves to who He is. Submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We are resting our faith solely in Him. We are turning from sin. We are turning from self to follow Him. So first of all, we believe in the name of the Son of God. And then it says, these things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Not only have I believed, but if you are a Christian, you will continue to believe. That's one of been, that has been one of the major themes of this epistle of 1 John. The believer continues to believe. Our faith is not perfect, is it? Nobody in this room has perfect faith. Our faith is not even constant. We all look within our own souls and we find the seeds of unbelief. I often think about Jesus and the disciples at the Last Supper. When Jesus told the disciples that night that one of them would betray him. And if we had come up with the narrative 
we would have played it out that somebody would have said, yes, I know, I knew it was that dirty Judas. I knew it. I knew it all along. I had it figured out. Jesus said, one of you will betray me. Do you realize that nobody looked at Judas that night? What did they do? The Bible says that one after the other after the other, they looked at Jesus and said, Lord, is it me? Lord, is it me? Why? Because every one of those men looked in their own hearts and in the strength of their belief and the strength of their love for Jesus, they had forsaken all to follow him, yet they found that little seed of unbelief. I could betray him. Lord, is it me? I don't want it to be me, but Lord, is it me? The man came to Jesus asking for his daughter to be healed. The Lord said, do you believe? And he says, yes, Lord, I believe. The Lord, help my unbelief. Our faith is not perfect. Our faith is not even constant. But the true believer continues to believe. I've said this over and over again. I'll say it again, and I don't want you to misunderstand this. There is no such thing as an unbelieving believer. In the big picture, in the grand scheme, there is no such thing as a true believer who just decides to no longer believe. If that is the case, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks when we come back to this text. John talks about it as somebody who sends a sin to death. There comes a time when a believer falls so far away from the Lord that the Lord takes that believer home. There is no such thing as a believer that the Lord just allows to continue to not believe. The true believer continues to believe. Hebrews chapter, eight, chapter 10 verses 38 to 39 says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we, believers, are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who continue to believe to the saving of the soul. Since salvation is 100%, it finds its origins in God, it finds its continuance in God, since, but since salvation is by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, we must come to the conclusion that when God saves a believer, he keeps that believer from falling. That is, the, that is uh, what Jude tells us. He keeps us from falling. The true believer will continue. Now, all of us knows somebody who at one time professed to believe that today is not living in that awareness, who is not living in that place. None of us has the right, has the ability, has the prerogative to pro pronounce judgment on that person and say, this person is not a true believer. We don't have that. We don't know. Though it may from the outside look like that person is not continuing on, you and I can't look into that person's heart and know what God is doing in their hearts. God does a work in the, in the true believer to eventually to draw them back to himself or to take them home to heaven. The true believer continues to believe. Uncertainty grates against us. Uncertainty is that which keeps us up at night. We crave confidence. We crave certainty in the midst of questions. We crave something, uh, as we sang about this morning, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We want that rock to put the feet of our faith on in a world that is full of doubts. But one of the things that I've said it over and over again in this message, take this away. Confidence comes by submission.
Confidence comes by submission. If you have not submitted yourself to the truth of God, to the faith of the gospel, you will have no confidence. If you are trying to usurp yourself over God, I like this about Christianity, I don't like that about Christianity, you should have no confidence. You should have no certainty because if you think you are able to pronounce judgment on God's truth, you are not saved. Confidence comes by submission. Am I willing to bow the knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Am I willing to submit myself to what the Bible says about me? To what the Bible says about my sin? To what the Bible says about salvation in Jesus Christ? This is the first thing. Praise God, we can have confidence. If you know Christ is your Savior, this is a verse. This, is a, this verse should be a pathway that you walk down over and over and over and over again. These things I've written to you who, be, who believe in this name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. It is not God's will that you be uncertain about your status with Him. God wants you to know. This should be a well-trodden verse in your heart. Memorize that verse if you have not. This passage describes other things that we can have confidence about as you look through the rest of this passage. Verses 14 to 17 describe confidence in answered prayer. Verse 18, we know that we have victory over sin. Verse 19, we know that we belong to God. Verse 20, we know who Jesus is. That's the territory we'll cover in a couple of weeks. But today, this is enough. We know that we have eternal life. Do you know it? Do you know it? Are you sitting here saying, Pastor Jared, hallelujah, I know. If you look at me today and say, Pastor Jared, I wish I knew, but I'm going to have to be honest, I don't know. Please, I would beg of you, let's talk about this today. Nothing would, make, would give me more joy than to sit down with you after the service and open up God's Word and share with you how that you can leave this place. You may have come in uncertainty, but you can leave with certainty that you have eternal life. Let's talk about it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would do this work in our hearts. We thank you that we can have confidence. We thank you that we can know. Lord, what a, what a grace that we can be thankful for that drowning in the sea of uncertainty that characterizes this world, that we can have the confidence the truth of God, of the faith of the gospel that is as strong as our Savior. And I pray that we would go away from this place walking in that confidence. Oh, Father, I do pray that for any here that are still uncertain, unsure, that today they would know Christ. We commit this thing to, all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.